Is it upside down to what it was before the Olympic Games? Uh, completely different. You know, heading into the Olympics, obviously you hope things go well, but I don't think any of us could have imagined you know, what happened and what has happened since. Do you still pinch yourself once in a while? Uh, every time I look at the medal, I'm like... Tell me your arms are purple. <laughs> <laughs> every time I look at the medal, I'm like, wow, this is pretty crazy. It is pretty I guess everybody wants to touch it and feel it and look at it. Yeah, that's the first thing people say. Can I touch it? <laughs> this is weird. <laughs> and I guess the longer that goes on, the weirder it seems. Yeah, Somebody's it needs always be, uh, it to needs to be sanitized, probably. Right All right. Okay. Well, the way this is going to work is we have people out there waiting to ask questions, and we'll get to that right now. And the first question comes from Dave Rowan. Dave, you're up. Go ahead. Hi, Christine. I was just wondering. It's been Hi. ten years since we've had a major event hosted on Canadian soil from the 2000. And Two under twenty women's World Cup was kind of your arrival party on as a force in women's soccer. Now we're three years away from hosting another event on Canadian soil. And what do you think it'll take to make first twenty fourteen and then twenty fifteen a major success, both off field and on the field? Ooh, good one. A lot. <laughs> um, I think on the field I think things will take care of themselves. Uh, you know, for our national team with John as a head coach, I think we're in great hands. We've got a great group um, that have a lot of experience. Hopefully some younger players are, you know, going to be up and coming and we'll make that roster. But based on our success in the Olympics, I think we'll do just fine on the field. Uh, off the field, you know, I think it, it the attention needs to continue, you know. Um, obviously things, it really hit Canadians, you know, what we did in, in London, um, but I don't think we can afford to go two or three years without, you know, games being played here, uh, things like that. I think it just needs to continue. The World Cup has, you know, huge potential, and I don't think we can let it pass by. Well, and, and you know what? I think it's it's important to note too that the men's program and the women's program in this country are country are intertwined, mm -hmm. meaning that if the Canadian men's team can have some success. In World Cup qualifying right now, and I know that that's a, a long, tough road, but it would keep the sport in the front pages and in the headlines, Absolutely. and lead towards first of all Rio, and then the women's event here in Canada a year later. It would be tremendous if that were to happen because the two programs really they can feed off each other, can't they? Oh, absolutely. The, you know, as a women's team, you need the men's team to to have a bunch of success, and, you know, make it to the next round of qualifiers, and hopefully make it to the World Cup. I think. Yeah, if that was to happen, then, I don't know, the country would just go crazy over soccer. And then right after that, we're hosting a World Cup. So, you know, we're hoping the men's team can qualify. Now, before we move on to the next question, you talked about, um, you know, success on the field and the players returning. Is anybody going to retire, do you think, from the current team before we get to 2015? Will everybody uh, still be there? Do you think uh, there's one or two or maybe gone? You know, there's a couple that have discussed uh, maybe going to school. Finishing up some schooling, but then the Olympics happened, and uh, everybody starts every, thinking a little everyone, differently, don't they? You know, knowing that we're hosting the next World Cup, uh, I think it's gonna be. I think it mm. might be up to John to like cut Make some those players. decisions. Because <laughs> everybody's all of a sudden going, hmm, maybe I want to be around for that. Exactly. Yeah. You know, it's it's, a, it's an exciting time for you know, soccer in this country, and as players, we all want to be a part of it. Right. Okay, let's move on to the next question. Dave, thank you for your question. Let's move on to Con now. Con, are you there? And if so, yes. fire away. Yes, I am. Hi, Christine. <laughs> hey there. My name is Con. Um, first of all, with what Dave mentioned there, that um, 2002 tournament is definitely the time that I really, really got invested into this program. I think since then it's just been, um, it's been such a road for, I think, for a lot of us who watched that tournament and to see you guys sort of go on. So just first of all, thanks for being such a great role model oh, since I was thanks. 12. So it's just been so, so great. Um, my question to you is um, about sort of what happens after you get the medal. Um, you know, a lot of people say that the biggest thing for them is that they have a lot of pride of, of being able to represent their country. But what really is the best perk about being a bronze medalist, about getting a little bit more recognition? Erin um, McLeod, she said in a CBC interview, she started getting some free Starbucks because people started recognizing her, you know? <laughs> so I was just wondering what you thought, what was the, your favorite part, your favorite perk, your favorite benefit of... Uh, this is this is supposed to be a selfish answer, so definitely. <laughs> favorite Earth. Probably getting to the front of the line everywhere you go. <laughs> no, I mean, oh man, I don't know. Like, 
I'm definitely not getting free Starbucks, so I don't know where Erin's <laughs> going. I need to start following her to Starbucks. But it's probably opened up things for you, right? Opened up other doors and opportunities for, off the field. For sure. Um, you know, in terms of sponsorships and things like that, that's that's definitely changed in the past few weeks. Um, and just, you know, financially, obviously, uh, things have changed. And then uh, opportunities that have sort of come up overseas in terms of playing professionally. You know, unfortunately, there's no pro league here in North America. Those things weren't happening before the Olympics. Um, but I think my greatest perk was actually getting to carry the flag. That was uh, that was absolutely incredible and, you know, obviously something that may never happen again. And just I was so proud to leave Canada in the closing ceremonies. What were you thinking about that like, during that time? Because we all watched that, of course, <laughs> and the smile on your face from ear to ear, <laughs> it was there from beginning to end. Your face must have been hurting from the smile. You know, it wasn't a forced smile, but obviously. No. You could tell that it was genuine, and you were just over the moon. What was that like? Well, I think I had that smile on from the second the, whist the whistle blew in the bronze medal game until uh, maybe a week after coming home. Just for me to win to win a medal at the Olympics, just a childhood dream come true. Not right. many people have that right. chance. And then to be asked to leave your country out in the closing ceremonies, um, just so proud, so happy, so nervous. Uh, didn't want to drop it or trip. <laughs> um, actually, a lady in front of me that was guiding us tripped. And I was like, oh no, don't. Do that. <laughs> um, so no, it was, just, it was a great experience. Great. Okay, Khan, thank you for your question. We'll move on now. Trisha and Talon. Which one's Trisha and which one's Talon there? Talon, you're the nine-year-old, are you? Welcome. Hi Go there. ahead. Go ahead, you guys. Ask your questions to Christine Sinclair. Hi. Hi there. I'm nine years old, and I've been playing soccer since I was five. Nice. Wow. I played for North Mississauga Target Team, and I have so many things. I love watching you and the Olympic team play soccer. Me and my family go crazy when we watch you. <laughs> you are my favorite player, and I would love to meet you. I went to the demo field on Friday and met most of the players. I like all positions, but I like midfield and striker best. Have you? Always play the same position, and when you're my age, do you think it's better to play one to two positions or a lot of Well, there That's you go. Good. Is it better to move around at that age or stick with one position? Uh, well, actually, uh, in my downtime, I've gotten involved in coaching, and so I'm coaching like 11 year olds, and they play all over the place. Right. I think uh, it's important for young players to to learn the game and you're not going right. to learn the game just playing one position and you know growing up my mom the superstar coach that she was um, you know had us playing all over the place and I think it really helped me you know to understand the game uh, and to actually find the position that I did love and right. that I could excel at. It, all, it only makes sense doesn't it that to learn the game properly you need to play every position when you're young so you can understand what the game looks like Absolutely. from different places in the field in different situations right? Absolutely and you know you come across coaches you know even on national teams and university that no you're not really a forward I'm gonna play midfield you know and if you've never played there before or you if you don't understand the position, uh, it's going to be difficult. You know, John, for instance, had me playing sort of an attacking midfield role right. in the Olympics. And, you know, thankfully I've played there before, but, you know, it started when I was at a young age. So when, at, your, at the youngest age that you can remember when you first started playing the game, where where did you first start? Do you remember the very first time I, you were out there, or were you just running all over picking bases? Um, no. <laughs> uh, well, my first game I was four. That's when I first started playing soccer. Right. and. My team, we were horrible. We lost every game. Um, and I don't even know if we had positions. It was just sort of like follow the ball wherever it goes. <laughs> it was just like bunch ball. <laughs> but that's okay. That's the way you learn yeah, how to play the absolutely, game, right? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. All right, Trisha and Talon, thank you for your question. Thank you. Okay. Trisha has one more. Oh. Let's, oh, you had a, do you have another question? Yeah, please. Oh, go ahead, Trisha. 
Okay, so um, as a soccer mom of talent, where you know life is all about soccer right now. Nice. And uh, how do you feel being a, a first of all female in soccer world from Canada? Now becoming this amazing inspiration and role model to all these little girls. We took um, like four or five of her soccer teammates down to BMO, and we stood in line for an hour and a half. And they literally started screaming when they saw all the other teammates and got the autograph. And then when you walked in on the field, it was madness for them. <laughs> How do you feel knowing that this is possibly the next women's national team and they look to you now? I, it's interesting and it's something I'm still getting used to. Uh, you know, but I think it's a it's a it's a good thing. You know, our goal heading into the Olympics was obviously to win a medal. But uh, I think more importantly, try and change the sport within Canada, and knowing that we were hosting the next World Cup, that we had a, a big opportunity and it was in front of us. And you know, for me, when I was young, you know, I was looking up to baseball players like Roberto Alomar. Right. You know, their women's soccer wasn't in the Olympics. Um, I didn't even know there was a World Cup for women. And it's good to see that things have changed, and now young girls can young girls can look up to female role models and aspire to be them, instead of looking at their male counterparts. Um, so I think it's it's awesome, and I think it's something that our team takes very seriously because it's about you know trying to leave soccer in a better place than when we found it when we first found the national team. Because that, the flip side to all that, of course, is the responsibility that comes with it. Do you feel added responsibility? In you know, since you've done what you've done, because obviously the recognition factor is out there, people look up to you more and more. Do you feel any kind of responsibility to, and I don't even know, to do what, or or is that fair to even suggest that? No, I think it's fair. Obviously, with our success in, in London comes some responsibility um, to your sport and to the young kids that one day dream of playing on the national team. Um, I like to think that us as a group of players are even before London happened, um, we're responsible and you know did everything we could to help grow the sport in Canada. Uh, but now it's all about continuing that with you know more requests and things like that. It's about saying yes and you know putting yourself out there so people can see you and you know, interacting with the young kids. Okay, Trisha and Talon, thank you very much for your participation. Now we still have some some other questions that we can ask here from people that haven't been able to join us, but we'll we'll go ahead here because we still have some time. Annie Younger had a question that she wanted to ask, and the question really is all about where you would consider playing next. And it's always a difficult issue right now for the women's game with the professional league, you know, coming and going over the years. And so, from that point of view, from a club situation. <laughs> I know, and it's Everyone a, it's wants a to know. I know. Do you, do you have any ideas at all yet? Um, I'm in discussion okay. with a few clubs, uh, obviously overseas. Right. Uh, it's not that not that we're prying here. I don't no, want you to get no, wrong, no, but no, if people it, want to know. Are you going to yeah. be able to keep playing? Because it's important, obviously. Yeah, absolutely. You know, unfortunately, there's no league in North America, no professional league, and it means a lot of us will be heading overseas in the new year. I know a couple are already heading over to Norway, for instance, in the next couple of weeks. Um, I've decided to take the fall off and recover and sort of rejuvenate because I know it's going to be another long four years, but I'll be heading overseas in the new year. Now, I know I know the coach, John Herdman, is <laughs> big on everybody playing right. somewhere. Is, is he able to help at all in terms of trying to get you guys sorted out with clubs to play for? Yeah, he's been very helpful. You know, he has many connections, obviously, throughout the soccer world, and you know, any player that wants to go overseas and play, uh, all they have to do is talk to him, and you know, he'll do his best to try and make it work out. Great. All right, let's move on. There's a question from uh, Ryan Lestage. I think I pronounced his name right, and if I haven't, I apologize in advance. The question has to do with the American team. Yeah, <laughs> the smile disappears. Do you notice that? <laughs> anyway, your performance against the U.S. team, the entire team's performance against the U.S. team uh, at the Olympics was just unbelievable. Uh, whether you were robbed of that win or not is, 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 is not the issue for this discussion. But that was a tremendous game. Uh, the Americans are always the team you want to beat so badly. Yeah. You must be looking forward to that next opportunity whenever it comes by. You know, it's, it's a tough one. You know, the Americans... Obviously, we played very well against them, but they just continue to win 
and people are like, oh, you got robbed, but you don't win three gold medals in a row without a lot of talent. And, you know, obviously that's what they've achieved. And we, for so long, we've been so close to them, and we're just waiting for that time to beat them in a big tournament. And, you know, I think a lot of us thought it was going to happen in London. Unfortunately, it didn't, but we'll, we'll get at them. Now, in so many of the recent losses to the United States, I think if, if you look deep inside your heart, you'd probably say at the end of the day, yeah, they were probably the better team, just mm -hmm. a little bit better than us. It, it always seems like they're just a little bit better than us. But I don't think you can say that about that game at the Olympics. So does, is that a, a positive? Does it give you any encouragement knowing, you know what, we were as good or better than them on that day. So going forward, you know it can be done. Oh, for sure. I think that game gave us a lot of confidence. Yeah, going forward, that they're the best team in the world, and when we play our best, we we're even with them. Um, but I I still think the thing that separates them from us is that's how they play every single game. Right. You know, it doesn't matter if it's the Olympic semifinal or a friendly or a qualifier. That's how they play. And for us, so far, it's been we performed well in London, and you know, I think of our game against Sweden, Great Britain. And then the U.S. Uh, we were there, um, but we need to do that on a consistent basis. Okay. Let's move forward with a question from Melanie Howard, and this has to do with the future. It might pertain to the Women's World Cup when it comes to Canada in 2015, and that is, what do you think needs to be done in this country to continue to develop female soccer players that we can keep competing at the highest level? Because we've seen it over the years, Christine. I mean, I've been doing Canada games ever since you were mm -hmm. just a youngster and we know way back then there were a few elite teams and then there was just everybody right. else. Mm -hmm. Well now there's a few elite teams and then there's a whole range of teams that are just simmering right. below that. Everybody's catching up. So what do we need to do to make sure that we continue to stay up there and, and ahead of the pack? I think we're on the right path actually. On the women's side, like, you know, especially with John as our head coach, he he spends a lot of time with the youth teams and the youth players, and I think that's the, the way to go. You know, we have the numbers in terms of participation in, in this country, and I think with John guiding the youth teams, you know, you'll see the benefit five, six years from now. You know, those players will will be tremendous. Right. You know. Now, what about, what about yourself in terms of, taking on a bit of a role in that regard as you get older. I mean, not suggesting you retire by any stretch no, of the retiring. imagination. I know you're not, but you did talk a little bit about coaching. Is that is that something that you enjoy doing and that maybe one day down the road you might you might think of doing that? It's something that I think a couple years ago I would have done now. Not at all. But as I've gotten into it, it's something that I'm really interested in. What's, what's changed your mind about it? Um, well, obviously I'm only helping coach some young kids, but I don't know, just seeing their love of the sport, how much fun they have, and seeing their development and how much you know a coach can influence them. Um, it's incredible. But I'm still sort of hooked on the maybe the physical side of the sport, you know, maybe being some sort of conditioning coach. So maybe John will hire me in a few years. You never know if he's still here. Yeah. Coach's <laughs> lifespan is not that very long. True, very does it does it bring when you watch the little kids and you're coaching youngsters? It, does it bring back memories to you in terms of what you like and what you felt and the joy that you had when you were a little kid playing? Oh, game? absolutely. You know, you just see that like they're fearless out there. That's the big thing. They they don't care if they make a mistake. They you know it's they're absolutely fearless, and you see them developing you know, almost by the day. And I remember going through that when every day you're breaking your juggling record and just how excited you were about that. Um, but kids today, they're they're crazy on the soccer field. <laughs> like they there's kids out there doing things that I still won't do on the soccer field in terms of like tricks and things. I'm like, I don't even think I can do that. <laughs> just little yeah. the, the physical talent that they have. Yeah, and the skill they have at such a young age. Uh, we didn't have that. But that's fantastic, yes. though, isn't it? We have to mine that and make yeah. sure that we, we keep that coming and mold that, right? Absolutely. I think so often kids, there's, you know, there comes a certain point where, okay, tricks and stuff are done. Now we got to win. Where, no. Like, keep you, playing. You know, fun, in right? Spain, for instance, on the men's side, you don't, I mean, look at them. They're incredible. Yeah. They're not being like, okay, now you just have to, like, 
I would bet that they were never told at yeah. any age along the way, oh, stop doing yeah. that because your position is center defense exactly. and you have to stay there. Exactly. Just They're kick the ball away. completely free out there, and that's what the young kids are like. And we just need to continue that. I want to ask you before we go, I think we're getting close to running out of time here, what's up next for the women's program and the women's team? Because obviously after the Olympics, it's a big... Big letdown, I guess, and say, like, "Oh, okay, that's yeah. over," and people don't think about what's next. So, take us through what's next for the women's team. Um, yeah, we're on a break right now. Um, all of us are sort of scattered all over the place. I think we have a, a tournament in China coming up in January, and that sort of kicks off our next four years. And then, you know, John has told us it's going to be a pretty busy and intense build up to the World Cup and then Brazil. So, you know, it, he's like, "Take a break now." So that's what we're doing. Yeah, exactly. And you know, hosting the next World Cup, we want to put on the show. Now he's based in in Vancouver. Yes. Is is that uh, probably where most of the training will be based? Is on the West Coast? I have no idea. You know, um, that's where we were in the build up to the Olympics, and it worked out great. Uh, I have no idea what will happen. Hopefully, a lot of players will will sign contracts and be able to play overseas or wherever, so that maybe we don't have to have a residency camp right now. You know, maybe that can wait until right before the World Cup. Okay. All right, everybody, thanks for joining us on the Google Hangout. Uh, how about a round of applause there from everybody out there for Christine Sinclair for joining us today. Very busy schedule these days, and she's taking the time to do this. So thank you, everybody, and thank you, Christine, thank you. for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Great. So long, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye.